We've got right around 7.30. Um, uh, we got some nice cases this morning for you. And uh, I think some good teaching points we can make about these. One thing I'll mention just right before <clears throat> we get started, there is a, uh, a session that uh, is a virtual session. It's a derm uh, immersion that uh, Dr. Regal is uh, putting on. Uh, I don't know if it's ac accessible to every resident, but it's a it's like a board review course, and it's all done virtually, and uh, it's it's really good. I mean, it goes over just about everything you need to go over in, a, in like a weekend. <clears throat> so you might you guys might want to see about checking into that. I'm going to be giving two talks. Um, one on neoplastic things, one on inflammatory things, most stuff you would have already heard, but um, it's a nice review. And for those of you in the especially third years, you're going to be taking the boards coming up. You might want to check into, uh, into that course because it's got, you know, basically kind of covers everything. It's, it's not, it's sort of like a review. If you can go through it and you feel like you know 80% of it or whatever, 85%, you know, you're probably good to go without even really studying really hard for the boards. On the other hand, if you go through it and you feel like, oh, I'm pretty deficient in some of these various areas, it can identify those and then you can focus more on, on the things that you kind of need to, to study for. So, uh, and I, we, I guess we'll get a recording of that. So if we get a recording of that, we'll post it on our site so you can at least watch what I give if you're interested in that, if you want to get just a little bit more. And I go through probably, you know, it's, I think it's two 15 minute talks. I'm going through about maybe 25 or 30 different diseases in each lecture. So it, it's it's an overview, but at least it gives you some, you know, kind of hits a lot of the most important points that um, that you might kind of be covered on the Durham Path Board. We'll cover everything, but at least give you some idea. So uh, anybody want to give this one a go? Sure, Dr. Cockrell, good morning. Uh, this is Usman from Baylor. I can take this one. Uh, so it looks like we have a punch um, and at this power, I would favor more of a neoplastic process. I see a whole lot of purple, um, just diffusely throughout the entire specimen going pretty deep into the sub Q. Sure. Um, so that would be my thought, uh, before we kind of zoom in further. Yeah. Excellent. Malignant, diffuse. I mean, when you see something like this, I mean, your first reflex should be that it's, um, not going to be good. <laughs> And uh, can you tell at low power, any ideas what you might be dealing with? Just as clues. Again, I, I'm not trying to make you guys to make a definitive diagnosis at low power. The idea is just to kind of make a, a, a low power guess. And then we're going to go to higher magnification and then um, confirm it. It's not really a guess, but if you apply criteria, you could sort of favor something based on what you're seeing here. So you said there's sure. a lot of purple. Yes, <laughs> um, a lot of purple, which would make me think um, lymphocytes just uh, off the top of my head. Um, yeah. Possibly, I mean, Merkel cell is a, is a thought um, as so well also, um, on the differential. Also. Yeah, and what else when you think of small blue cell, bad quote <laughs> lesions, you know, blue in, in dermatopathology generally, if you see lots of dense blue and a low power view, it, it, you sort of, your heart sinks because you don't think it's going to be a good diagnosis. And uh, there's a couple other things that you should at least, you know, throw in the back of your mind when you're looking at, at a, something like that, mm -hmm. besides those two. Um, I, don't, I mean, this is rare, but I suppose you could think of a neuroblastoma. Yeah, good. Excellent. The pediatric blue cell tumors. That, that's what was the, the main question there. So, yeah, Wilms tumor, neuroblastoma, Ewing's, all those things. Those things all will give you this sort of a poorly differentiated blue cell they're kind of analogous to merkel uh you know like the neuroendocrine they're, they're sort of in that same general family if you will they're not exactly the same but they're like that is there any clue on this side that can might favor one of those versus the other that you can see here uh well i suppose i mean this is very generic it looks might look a little more purple than than blue um I mean, which, I, I mean, it depends on the staining and whatnot, but. Um, it's mainly calling your attention to this little area uh, right here. <laughs> yes, there's a, a Gren zone. Um, yeah. Of sorts that, that is there. 
And that's actually uh, something that we do see a lot of times in these lymphoid lesions. So um, if you see that at low magnification, you might say, wow, there's this dense, poorly differentiated blue cell lesion with a grin zone. I'm going to think it might be a lymphoma. And then uh, go to higher magnification and then see if, if you can verify that. And, uh, you know, at this power, now what would you think? Uh, at this power, sorry, I was, I was muted. Um, at this power, uh, I, I would favor, I mean, these look like lymphocytes to me at this yeah, power. I agree. I think they are. And if you look uh, in some areas, you can see some small cells. That, that, that's clearly would strongly favor a lymphocyte there. That one might even be a, a, a plasmacytoid lymphocyte, um, but it's very poorly differentiated. And so on a scale of one to 10, I mean, this, this is not good. I mean, this is, this is going to be a, a poorly differentiated lesion. Now the mm -hmm. board's not going to really expect you, they, they don't want you to be a lymphoma pathologist. So they're not going to ask a lot of detailed questions about this, but they might ask some things that they would sort of expect you to know generally. So if you were going to, place a bet as to whether this is going to be a B or a T cell neoplasm, which would you favor here and why? Um, I would favor a B cell. Um, yeah. If I remember, I'm, I'm not sure if this is accurate, but I, I thought a Gren zone was involved possibly in B cell lymphomas. That's correct. The T cell lymphomas tend to give you more epidermotropism as a general rule. They don't have to. You can get uh, T cell lymphomas that don't involve the epidermis at all. But we generally think of T cell lymphoma, the mycosis fungoides CTCL pattern, where you get epidermotropism and kind of a band like infiltrates. So you generally don't spare the papillary dermis in that. Whereas in the B cell lymphomas, you tend to. Uh, lymphomatoid papulosis, for example, which is a T-cell process, or uh, the CD30 positive lymphomas, those tend to involve the epidermis and often give an ulcerated appearance. So uh, as a general rule, and again, it's not hard and fast, but as a general rule, if you spare the epidermis, think more B. If it involves the epidermis, you tend to think more of a T-cell lymphoma. And then if you were going to do some further studies here, uh, obviously, you could work it up with uh, the B cell immunoperoxidase markers and T cell markers and gene rearrangement studies and those sort of things. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a as another sort of general question here, um, we know that there there are some B cell lymphomas. They might ask you some generic sort of information about some of the more common cutaneous B cell lymphomas because they have hit the literature in the last few years. Um, there's three main ones that we think about in, in dermatopathology. Um, I don't know if you know those or not, but what if I, I'll just ask if you do, and you can say what they are. Sure. Um, I think maybe CD20 is, is a marker for B cells. Um, That's correct, it is. If uh, is BCL2, is that one of them as well? That can be, yes, it, yes, absolutely. Although it actually will also stain T cells. But I was asking mainly, what are the three diagnoses, the three B cell lymphoma diagnoses? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Clinically, I and of see. course, we would work them up using those markers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, you can have like the the marginal zone. Uh, good, good. B -cell that's, lymphoma. That's, that's one of them, um, and then there's two others. So there's, it's really uh, very, very simple, you know, sort of lymphoma pathology 101 for that. They're not going to really ask you any detail, but they would probably expect you to know what a marginal zone lymphoma is. Uh-huh. Um, and then we have the diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Yes. And that, that would be more like what you would see here. Uh, this is obviously a very, very diffuse pattern. So that name fits. It's got very atypical cells and it's diffuse large B cells. These are large cells. And they also often refer to that as an anaplastic, very atypical uh, lymphoma. And here you can see these cells are very, very poorly differentiated and, and really obviously no, uh, no question that this is malignant. You know, when you just see the cytology of this. Mm -hmm. Then there's one last one. It's okay if you hadn't heard. Uh, of it. I think that one I might not. I may not have heard of that one. It's okay. Uh, it's it's called the follicle center cell lymphoma, and so uh, that those two, the marginal zone lymphoma, follicle center cell lymphoma, uh, years ago, a lot of those just generally got called um, pseudo lymphomas because they have a very very low grade biologic behavior. When you look at the cells, they look like small lymphocytes, and uh, if you look at the uh, 
uh, cytology of the marginal zone lymphoma, you'll often see some plasma cells and plasma cytoid morphology. That lesion may be associated with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia and uh, IgM uh, paraproteins because it's obviously got the plasma cytoid morphology, but has those have a very, very low, uh, you know, malignant potential. They, they tend to come up in the skin. They stay there for a long time. Sometimes you biopsy them and they come back for, to get their sutures removed and the thing's gone away. And uh, they may kind of come up again periodically and, and then eventually, rarely, they may go to a lymph node, uh, but they have a low-grade biologic behavior. This lesion, in contrast, has a very high-grade biologic behavior. And, um, you know, there's some differences in the markers between these. The uh, marginal zone lymphoma will often give you some light chain restriction, kappa or lambda. Uh, the marginal, the uh, follicle center cell lymphoma, uh, again, that'll stain with uh, BCL6 in the center of those follicles, they have the, they don't really form nice germinal centers that are classic like a pseudolymphoma. They talk about so-called inside out germinal centers. The germinal center is no longer just confined to the center with lymphocytes surrounding it. It kind of is more poorly organized and diffuse. Uh, and there's some other markers. BCL2 will stain those if it involves the skin secondarily. If it's a primary lesion, uh, the BCL2 will just stain the, the T cells that are kind of in the, in the lesion. And then the BCL, uh, then this lesion here is going to be stained with things like MUM1 and TIA and some things like that. They're, they're not going to probably get into too much of that. But I think if they showed you something like this, you should say, uh, well, this is not the pattern that you would expect to see in a, in a marginal zone lymphoma or um, a follicle center cell lymphoma, because those tend to be more nodular, almost kind of teardrop shaped uh, aggregations, whereas this is very diffuse. It's involved in the top to bottom, side to side. And uh, this is often seen on the leg uh, of older women, interestingly enough. And, and it, uh, not, it's not confined to that, but that's a, a common scenario. And it has a bad prognosis, 50% five-year survival. Um, this is an aggressive type of lymphoma. So uh, you'd want to, obviously, if you ever encounter one of these, these patients end up in the hands of an oncologist pronto. But the others, actually, you sort of don't want to get in the hands of an oncologist. You, you don't want them to be overly treated, over aggressively treated. These patients, you know, need your dire attention. And there's one last uh, lymphoid lesion that I'll just mention. This is not what this lesion is, but there is a, a relatively newly um, popularized lesion, uh, blastic plasmacytoid dendrocytic neoplasm, that you've probably heard about. Uh, it's, uh, you probably read about it in, in some of the throwaways and in some of the journals. Um, it's actually a lesion that is not really a lymphoma. It's really more kind of analogous to a leukemia. It's got a CD123, uh, CD4, CD56 positive staining. Uh, and so you can remember that CD123456. And that generally has got a very aggressive biologic behavior as well. It used to be called uh, hematodermic neoplasm and uh, associated with uh, histiocytic ph uh, phagocytosis, some of those bad sort of prognostic variables. The reason it's kind of important to know about that today is that there's a drug that's been uh, marketed recently that actually can take that from basically 100% you know, five-year mortality down to almost 100% response to therapy and can really improve their prognosis. So you need to diagnose that early if you can. So you might get asked a question about that just because that's been popularized recently with this new therapy that we didn't have anything for it years ago, and it was really a, a bad uh, tumor. So just remember that lesion also. So those, those are probably the main things you'll, you'll have to know if you're being faced with some kind of a, a lymphoid lesion on an exam. Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Cockrell. You're welcome. Okay, who wants to give this one a go? I can go. This is Leah from Baylor. Good morning. Good morning. So here we have something that was I'm not quite sure how it was obtained, how the specimen was obtained, but um, it looks like we're in the, perhaps a punch or um, maybe they were scooping something out at the bottom of a punch. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, another, <laughs> we think of punch, shave, excision, and then there's kind of a, a fourth one that we we don't usually think about called enucleation. Um, and you've, you've enucleated lesions already, like those pa patients come in those pilar system, a scalp, and you just make a nice little incision over it and you pop it out like delivering a baby. That's probably what they did here. In other words, they probably, and, and we see this 
technique used when clinicians think they're dealing with a cyst. Um, mm -hmm. They'll go in and try to make an incision over it. And they say, well, this feels like a cyst. They try to pop it out. And then sometimes something does pop out. And sometimes, as you know, if you're, the cyst is ruptured, it doesn't pop out quite as easily. And then you have to go into the curette and try to scrape out and scoop out everything that's in there. So that's mm -hmm. probably what they did here. Sure. So that might be a good clue. <laughs> but anyways, I, my eye is drawn to these white entities in the uh, dermis and subcutis. And it's kind of surrounded by this eosinophilic material. And when I look at these white things, I, my mind kind of goes to two different options. Perhaps this is like a retraction artifact or it's something endogenous or exogenous that the bot that is elic eliciting a reaction. Um, and I have to say, when I see all these kind of multinucleated um, cells and that are, look like they're engulfing the white things, <laughs> I'm favoring more of a reaction to something endogenous or exogenous. Good. Yes, that's exactly the way to think about that. And so you can see these are multinucleated histiocytes that have engulfed this material. And um, can you tell by looking at it whether it's more likely to be endogenous or exogenous just by looking at it? By looking at it, it looks exogenous. I have not yes. seen the body something look like this. And there's no blood vessels around to make me think that it's like a cholesterol cleft. Good. Yeah, you can see it's actually, mm -hmm. it looks like a crystal of some kind. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can see that it's, it's actually, the light is being refracted through this. And if we had polarization microscopy, uh, this would really polarize beautifully. And so, mm -hmm. as you know, you know, crystals, when you polarize them, the light sort of gets uh, transmitted in a different way and it comes back and, and gives you this nice, beautiful little uh, sort of yellowish uh, color when you, when you move your polarized lens. And this would polarize very, very strongly here. So when you think of some kind of crystal like that, obviously you're thinking of some kind of an exogenous foreign substance. Now, is this anything that looks like uh, maybe it might have been injected by, say, a, uh, a, a physician or, or maybe a, an esthetician or something? Does it look like a filler? Yeah, it does look like a filler. It's been... Um evenly distributed. Okay, it's possible. I think it's Does this look like any filler though that you're familiar with? And, um, you know. So as, as I was reviewing for this um, session, I did come across poly -L lactic acid, which does look a lot like this. Although I will say that these look a little bit more like oval to fusiform in shape. And the pictures I found online of poly L looked a little bit more spiky. So, but that was my, my contention. It's possible, um, you know, it could be, although I, most of the ones that, that I've seen that they tend to be rounder than this and they kind of look a little bit more homogeneous. You know, this is mm -hmm. just so, um, it's so much, these individual crystals vary so much in size and shape. I mean, it kind of makes me think perhaps it was something that wasn't uh, iatrogenically induced. It was maybe something that may have been traumatically induced. Like maybe the person mm. had an auto accident or something and got some uh, silica crystals in them. Uh, another clue, sometimes if you'll see some blackish material in there, that may be soil that gets implanted. So we weren't sure what the foreign body was here. I don't, I don't remember the story on this, but as I recall, looking at most of the fillers, they, they don't look exactly like this, but you know, that's, there's so many fillers coming out every day that uh, I wouldn't say it couldn't be a secondarily induced, something that was induced by the, uh, you know, by therapy. Uh, so anyway, the, the key to this though, is understanding, knowing that this is one of the foreign bodies. And I would, uh, would also recommend being able to identify things like calcium hydroxyapatite, which radius, uh, the polyolactic acid, like you talked about, the methyl methacrylates, all the various things in there that they do inject, uh, juvederm, the hyaluronic acids, you very well could get a question about that. Because we are seeing, obviously, tons of fillers that get injected. Uh, patients do get reactions to those, even though they're supposed to be um, inert. Uh, some patients just, they, they react to them. And even, even uh, elemental uh, silica that basically is supposed to be, or silicone, 
that's supposed to be purely non-immunogenic, we occasionally see patients get granulomatous reactions to that also. So um, go back and make sure as you're studying that you uh, know what the fillers are, know what they look like when they're injected in the skin. You easily could get a question or two about that. And uh, you, they're pretty straightforward. So you may as well get the easy ones, <laughs> save up for the, the ones that are almost impossible. Good. Any questions about this one? No, thank you so much. Okay, great. Good job on that. Okay, this one's kind of cool also. Hey, Dr. Cockrell, this is Christina from Baylor. I can take this one. Okay. So we have a couple of sections here on this slide. Um, anatomic site, I'm not positive. Um, this does look like a shave biopsy, and I would put this on the thing, uh, the spectrum of inflammatory um, rather than neoplastic. Good. Um, and then in terms of the reaction pattern, I see this subepidermal split here. So it's kind of nice. like that subepidermal vesicular dermatitis thing. Good. Um, I guess it does, there's not like a lot going on within like the blister itself but there are some kind of smaller dark almost like dark purple to black cells up here in the kind of um, upper papillary dermis and zooming in I thought they looked mostly like neutrophils they kind of had like that multi-nucleated shape to them yeah or multi lobulated uh, nucleus excuse me <laughs> yeah exactly no you're exactly correct so basically you're you're doing exactly what you should do uh, so you basically have defined this as an inflammatory process uh you said it's a blister you think it's a subepidermal blister which is mm -hmm. the next thing to do and then uh look at the cells that comprise if you know, ask yourself whether it's got uh, whether it's got inflammation or not, and this one does have inflammation, so it's not a cell poor blister, mm -hmm. sort of like you know one of the say porphyrias or, or epidermolysis bullosa, something like that. So it's a true inflammatory subepidermal process comprised mostly of neutrophils. So then you know you're you're close to home right there. There you really don't have a uh, a huge differential diagnosis when you've gotten it narrowed down like that. So that shows you how the method works. And uh, you said that these are mostly neutrophils. So what are the, you know, really three to four diagnoses that you're really looking at here? Yeah, so uh, DH, um, linear IgA bolus dermatosis, and I think bolus lupus. Yeah, those are the three main ones. So it's all, yeah, that's, that's you know, basically for your purposes, you're correct. That's it. There are some others that can rarely give you uh, subepidermal blisters and neutrophils. Occasionally, you'll see a neutrophil-rich bullous pemphigoid or a neutrophil mm -hmm. uh, EBA. That's that's rare, and, and even rarer, uh, you'll see porphyria with neutrophils in the infiltrate. Mm -hmm. But those uh, those are sort of icing on the cake. You know, once you've gotten these three number one uh, entities that you mentioned right there, that's it. And because the the differential is relatively low. Uh, the board might presume you to get to that differential pretty quickly. And then they might say, well, let's ask some second order type of questions. So what other kind of things, you know, be expecting that they might ask you? Um, just a couple other sort of points. Um, we always like to look at the roof of the blister, especially if it's a cell pour process, uh, and see if there are significant numbers of individually necrotic keratinocytes lining up at the base of the epithelium, which is the so-called caterpillar bodies that we see with por porphyria. Uh, there's a couple of dyskeratotic cells here, but certainly not a lot of them that would for, you know, go along with that diagnosis very well. Um, you could definitely get this type of blister with either linear IgA or DH. Um, so just because it looks like a fairly large, it's not a real large blister, but it, it's got uh, a nice collection of neutrophils kind of going across the base of the entire blister that might favor linear IgA slightly, but um, you can definitely see this in DH also. 
there's one other clue. I think I might have mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when we looked at maybe another case kind of like this. But if you can see this, this is solar elastosis here. But the papillary dermis doesn't usually have solar elastosis. It usually is down more in the upper reticular dermis. And if you see basophilia of the collagen up here like this, where the collagen becomes sort of basophilic, almost looking a little bit like solar elastosis, that's often accompanies neutrophilic inflammation. So that's another clue that you're dealing with the possibility of dermatitis herpetiformis. But in, the, in order to distinguish this, obviously we would do immunofluorescence and you know mm -hmm. what pattern we would see there. Mm -hmm. So, and so in, in DH, it's typically like a granular IgA deposition, like at the tips of the dermal papilla. Correct. Characteristically, and then in the linear IgA, it's linear <laughs> IgA um, kind of deposition kind of more continuously um, along the DE junction. Um, so what are the two clinical scenarios where we see linear IgA bullous dermatosis? So Would I think it's- favor, well, Looking at this, for example, um, just from a clinician's perspective, which of the two diagnoses would you tend to favor here and why? I was thinking more DH here just because it's like a, a more like localized yeah, that, it's, I, it, I think this actually was DH, but um, what, where do you usually see DH? What's the clinical scenario of a classic DH patient? Oh, like um, typically it's on like the extensor surfaces, like the elbows, yes. your celiac disease. Um, and the, yeah. in the presacral areas, things like that. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what can you say about this biopsy here? Is this from the elbow or the presacral area? Um, I don't think so. Yeah, it doesn't have the right cornified layer for the elbow. It's got a lot of sun damage. Uh -huh. So that'd be, unless this person likes to go out and drop their drawers and sunbathe for years, <laughs> be <laughs> unlikely to be in that location. Okay. Uh, so it's an older person as well, most likely, with this much solar elastosis. And what's the actual age of presentation of a DH patient? I believe it's more like 40s and 50s, like middle-aged. Yeah, or even younger, even yeah. younger. Sometimes we see it in, in uh, you know, teenage, 20s, 30s, that sort of thing. So this is a much older patient. So mm -hmm. what's the scenario where you usually see linear IgA dermatosis? Um, well, it can be like medication-induced, for yeah. example. Yeah, exactly. or really patients on like zinc or diuretics or something. Yeah, older patients mm -hmm. that would get that. So this is an older person. They've got a set of neural blister with all these neutrophils. <laughs> um, you might say, well, just looking at that, um, mm -hmm. maybe it's linear IgA, you know, just okay. based on that alone. Um, I think it actually turned out to be DH in this case. I think this was somebody that had a known case and they developed some new lesions on a sun exposed area. So it doesn't always work. But if you were just going to place a bet, um, if you say, well, you know, this is kind of a diffuse blister with lots of polys, not just only at the tips of dermal papillae. And um, it doesn't have too many EOs. And sometimes in DH, because it's so pretty, you'll get eosinophilic infiltrate secondarily. It isn't an older person. And so you might think, maybe linear IgA. And what's the other setting of linear IgA besides an old person taking vancomycin and other medications? Oh, there's a childhood variant, like Good. in our pediatric patients. Excellent. And that's also known as chronic bullous dermatosis of childhood. So that obviously wouldn't fit here. Uh, but they would they might ask you some questions about about this. They, they might say, uh, this biopsy showed a linear deposition of IgA. What medications might be most commonly associated with this, or they might say this showed a uh, granular deposition of IgA at the tips of the papillae. What, what HLA subtype is associated with this? Mm -hmm. um, or what other diseases like celiac disease you mentioned, or uh, IgA, uh, you know, uh, intestinal lymphoma can be associated mm -hmm. with pH. So just remember those various other things that they might ask, because it is pretty straightforward here. Um, and I would probably not favor uh, bullous lupus, um, usually in bullous lupus, even though you get neutrophils, you'll also see some features of more classic vacuolar alteration and lupus erythematosus at the, you know, at, at other um, areas of the biopsy. So, but you're right. Those are the three things that you want to mention in the differential when you, when you see um, a subapodermal blister with neutrophils. 
Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, Dr. Cockrell, this is that girl uh, for Baylor. I can take this one. Okay, great. So here we have a punch um, from this level. Uh, I can start to see that there's a central indentation, maybe with some reactive uh, cells around that indentation. Uh, the epidermis also looks like candidotic. So I'm, I'm, I'm leaning toward this being more of an inflammatory response of something foreign. Okay. Uh, and I mean, I think it's pretty hard to miss that we have this very large, uh, you know, object kind of piercing through the uh, epidermis um, uh, here on this um, section. Good. So if, it's interesting, if you look at this section over here, you know, they probably would show you this, but you might get this one over here and you can still make the diagnosis even over here, but uh, this material here is, is almost pathognomonic for what you see here. So what's the diagnosis here? So I'm thinking uh, this kind of uh, like a tick bite yeah, this is a tick, a tick. And you can see that here's the tick. It's got its mouth part still in here. Uh, instead of trying to extract the tick using a match or whatever and get it to release and then pulling it out, they just decided to go ahead and just take a punch biopsy of the entire process and, and remove it. Now, this, interestingly enough, this stuff over here, this is the tick chitinous mouth part. This is actually a chemical that gets produced when the tick releases the salivary enzymes, it reacts with the collagen and produces a glue, if you will, that holds the tick in place. And that's why when you yank it out, this often stays in there. And this, this stuff just kind of, it's like a cement, if you will. It, it actually uses your collagen plus the enzymes to produce this hyalinized pink material here. And that is really, it's like, you know, Gorilla Glue, <laughs> and it, it just, it leaves that tick mouth part in there. So that's why you don't want to just, you know, pull it out because it ain't coming out of there. It's, it's really firmly attached. Um, now the, what, this is pretty straightforward here, but let's say again, I like to play this sort of game where, you know, you get to be the writer of the board question and you get to try to fool your colleagues um, and see what kind of things you could put in here that would be in the differential diagnosis that someone might possibly choose, um, you know, as opposed to a tick bite here. So I'll show you this slide. So I need to think of three other things to put down for the multiple choice, and I'll maybe add a fourth at the end. But what, uh, what other things could you put down that might a, a sort of non-dramatopathology educated resident would possibly choose as a distractor here? I mean, I think you could consider like a like a splinter or some type of other foreign okay. object. Good. So they just wouldn't recognize that this was an arthropod. That's mm -hmm. that's good. What else? Um, That'd be a pretty easy one. What what do you want to put some other arthropods in here? Yeah. So I think you could consider like uh, something like a scabies mite. Uh, good. As well. good. Um, That'd still maybe. be pretty easy, but they you'd have to be pretty dumb to think of this as scabies. We know scabies kind of lives up in this area right up in here. And the epidermis, yes, yeah. sir. And then I guess, uh, I think maybe like a flea bite, but I don't think you would have a flea like stick to the skin as you would see like in, with a scabies or a, or a, a tick. Now, is there is there something that's like a flea? It's got a name of a flea. It's It's it, I'm not sure. I guess it actually may be in the flea family that does actually burrow into your skin. Mm. Not sure, sir. I mean, like, I mean, like, uh, like a, like a, like a lot. I guess not lice, but uh, like a sandfly, maybe. Or well, sandfly bites and injects you, and then. It doesn't actually, actually, the way it works is it, it actually does bite your skin and it's carrying, uh, well, that's if you want in one disease, but if you get a sand fly, they're actually bite you and then they inject uh, the organisms of leishmania into your skin. And then you get, you know, leishmaniasis from that. But uh, so that's one, but there is actually is a flea that can actually burrow into your skin. 
Mm. Anybody know what that is? Like Demodex or something? No, that's actually a different type of organism. It's a okay. mite that lives in the follicles of, of our face and our your eyelids and that sort of thing. So let's say you're going to the beach, you know, for a holiday, especially down, say, maybe go to the Caribbean or something, and you're walking around, laying around on the beach, you come home and you've got a bump often on your foot. And uh, it's often, sometimes even underneath your, your, your nail or sand gets in there. And then there's, there's some, something in there, a, a nodule develops and you say, yeah, this feels kind of weird. And it feels like sometimes it kind of even moves a little bit. And then somebody biases it and they see something sitting down in here that's sitting in the middle of your dermis, a little sort of snout that's sort of facing upward like that. Does anybody know what that is? It's called tunga penetrans, and it's called sand flea is what the organism is. And it lives in the sand in the beach area and people that go sit on the beach and lie on the sand, sometimes they get an infestation of that. And especially when you're walking on the sand. So I would recommend knowing that. Um, and again, that doesn't give you the same kind of pattern where it's sort of the mouth part that's sort of down here and cementing itself in. There you've actually got a burrowing organism that's setting up shop down here. And it's got its uh, mouth part, it, it may be the anus part, but it's actually, it's got something connecting to the, uh, to the surface. And when you go back out into the sand, eventually when it gets, it releases the eggs and it can sort of, that's how it sort of recreates. So it burrows into an animal. Man is an accidental host, it's not the, the main host. And then it releases the eggs and it, you know, perpetrate, it kind of perpetrates itself that way. So you need to know that one because they may ask you that. And then uh, what else tends to burrow down into the skin and, and can look a little bit like this, sort of? Mm. So I think, I mean, we can think of like a, like a singer from a bee, but you wouldn't see an or, a, a organism uh, or like a live organism like we see here. You'd see more like a foreign object. Exactly. Those, uh, those are good ideas that you might want to put out. But there's one other thing that you should know about that does burrow into the skin. Uh, you know, patients, once again, will be going down to the Belize, you know, everybody likes to go down there and, and hike in the jungle, and they think that that's a safe thing to do, and they come back and they've got these welts on their skin, and, uh, and they feel like, they, again, they're moving, and, you know, you, you, you take a biopsy, and it's got this ugly-looking thing sitting down in the middle of the dermis with these brown, black spikes at the periphery. Yeah, I think uh, you can think of, like, hookworms, I would think. Um... Those tend to live kind of way up here and they're pretty small. Uh, but there is one other organism that you should know about that tends to uh, give you that pattern I just described. And that's caused by a different kind of fly. That's caused by a bot fly or a warble fly. And that fly bites you. It's got these little, you know, little tiny organisms that are glued to its abdomen then when, it, when it's sitting on your skin, it bites you, it releases these onto your skin, you scratch at it, and then they embed in your skin, and then they start growing in there. And then, you know, patient comes back and they said, I feel these things are moving. Nobody knows what that is. That's myiasis. Myiasis. In fact, Dr. Rapini says it should be pronounced myiasis. He's probably right, but I've always heard of myiasis. But anyway, that's another thing. And dermatobia hominis is the one that causes that organism and that could be on the boards. They like to ask some questions about parasitology and some things like that. So make sure you know those, there's like only about four or five organisms that'll burrow into your skin and, and actually sort of set up shop in there. Tunga penetrans, that, um, you know, this thing is not really doing that, but you can see it's penetrating your skin and it can leave the mouth part in there. And then you can actually see that cement stuff over here still. This is just a residuum of that same kind of pinkish, material off to the side of it. And notice the very dense inflammatory infiltrate. These things will often give you lots of inflammation. It can give you a really, a pseudo lymphoma can develop from this. So, and also you should know the various organisms um, and diseases that are associated with tick uh, bites, obviously Lyme disease. Um, they might ask you a question or two about the difference of the morphology between the Lyme disease tick and uh, Dermacentaur ticks, the dog ticks, and American am amblyoboma ticks, which look different. So just make sure you're, you know, a little bit about that. And it's pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. 
Uh, but no, you're right. This is a classic example of a tick bite reaction. So that you got right. And you would have fooled a few of your colleagues, I think, along the way. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, hi, Dr. Cockrell. This is uh, Michael from UT Houston. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right. So here from high power, we're seeing a punch biopsy of what is primarily a dermal nodule. Um, kind of still from high power, maybe on the uh, top of the punch, uh, we are seeing uh, what looks like a lot of solar elastosis, which could clue us into that either one, this may be a little bit of an older patient, or this could be uh, on sun exposed skin. And then as we get kind of on a little bit higher power, I think what stands out is this uh, almost like plywood like pattern of uh, eosinophilic uh, collagen bundles with these prominent clefts um, throughout. It's kind of a minimal cellularity. Um, there's some scattered fibroblast nuclei, but it's not uh, overall uh, very cellular. So depending on what we think these smooth kind of wavy cells are, um, kind of a broad differential. So uh, if you were to think this was smooth muscle, you could think of lyomyoma. If you think this is neural, you know, from high power, maybe this could look like a palisade encapsulated neuroma. Um, I think this is probably a fibrohistiocytic uh, lesion. I think it's far too uh, regular and uh, uniform to be anything like a DSP. Um, so I think ultimately I would call this uh, a sclerotic fibroma, the circumscribed store form uh, collagenoma. Okay, good. So that's very good. The, your differential is excellent. Um, again, if you look at low magnification, you can see it's a very small, well circumscribed kind of lesion. So we'd obviously favor benign very symmetrical. Uh, we, we wouldn't even, we would not think of DFSP obviously from this power. So you you could theoretically think of it if you're just looking at the cells of origin possibly, but we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't put that into really a reasonable differential diagnosis based on the fact that it looks like a small papule. The other things you mentioned are, are reasonable as well. Um, but I think you're, you clued in on, on the classic pattern, the so-called uh, little clefts here with the plywood like pattern that you see here with the scattered fibroblast. So yes, this is a classic example of a storeform, circumscribed storeform collagenoma or a sclerotic fibroma. And once again, because it's pretty simple, they might expect you to get it pretty quickly and then ask you some second order questions about it. So obviously you know what disease this is associated with, correct? Uh, yes, this would be a Cowden syndrome often. Right, and they, they would probably ask what some of the neoplasms are that might be associated with Cowden syndrome and other entity, other lesions that might be associated with Cowden syndrome. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of um, uh, hamartomatous growths um, and increased risk of um, uh, other like malignancies. Do you know which kind of malignancies they tend to get? Um, some... Uh, well, for uh, tumors, kind of uh, a lot of uh, adnexal ones. Um, what about systemic malignancies? I'm not sure off the top of my head. I believe they're mostly GI, as I recall. And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, GI malignancies are the ones that they, uh, as, I, as I recall, are the ones that they tend to get. So I'd bone up on that. You know, they, they do like to ask, if it's a simple pathology question, uh, sometimes they just will progress straight into asking you other questions. They may ask you the inheritance of this, which I'm sure you know as well. I actually don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> I think it's autosomal dominant. And then uh, they might even ask some of the genetics of it, uh, especially if they have uh, have genetic. And I, as I recall, again, I, and I haven't read about this in a while either, but I think it's a P10 mutation that they get. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but those are the things that they, they might ask you about, especially if they're more and more today, especially as we're moving into uh, personalized medicine and understanding genetics of, of diseases. Um, they want you to know that and they want you to know uh, the, the, you know, getting genetic counseling and if other family members need to be screened for cancer and, and those sort of things. So um, they might really focus more on that than just expecting you to get the diagnosis. And they might just figure, well, oh, you know, even a first year resident should be able to get this after, you know, the first uh, few lectures in dermatopathology. So now we're going to ask them, you know, what actually they need to know about some of the more serious issues associated with it. So anyway, that's, this is a classic example of that. And I think Dr. Rapini was one of the guys who was originally involved in some of the early uh, uh, 
papers associated with this. So um, you can ask him about the history of uh, how he was involved in, in, uh, in the Cowden syndrome, original diagnoses. Okay, another, another good case. Okay, I'm up next. This is Brandy. So we have a punch. And then there is a pretty much nodular infiltrate there. It's pretty prominent in blue. So as far as like neoplastic versus inflammatory, I think it's kind of hard to tell from this power, but I was favoring inflammatory, just like a dense infiltrate. It's got a lot of inflammation in there, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I agree. And so that's one of the things when you uh, get an inflamed neoplasm, sometimes it can be difficult to tell. But there's a couple of things in here that might sort of clue you off that maybe there's something else going on other than just inflammatory cells here. Are you talking about the like the slit-like spaces and the yeah? There's some there's cells? some clear areas here and some spaces that you know that sort of looks a little weird for just inflammation. Uh, and then we maybe even look down here at, at this piece also, which is even deeper, and say so, yeah, you know, there's there's something that doesn't look normal about this. It's got this purple amorphous material. Maybe it's undergoing necrosis on moss. There's some inflammation here, but, you know, so yeah, it's inf inflamed, but we're going to look at higher magnification, make sure there's not a neoplasm in here that's basically getting inflamed. Okay. And now you see anything more as we go to higher magnification here. So those there look foamy, like histiocytes that are foamy. And I thought the prominent cell here was histiocytes. Okay. Uh, but well, let's, let's mix, just, there's others too, but. So when you're, so you, you concluded that these were foamy histiocytes. Now, one thing you have to be careful of is jumping to a conclusion. If you don't really apply full criteria, because you could just say, ah, these are foamy histiocytes, therefore it's gotta be a xanthoma or something like that. And, and the board might, do that to you. They, they might say, okay, we're going to put xanthoma on here because we know that they're going to think these are just all foamy histiocytes. But there's some other things that are a little bit funny about this. Um, what about all these red blood cells here? I mean, is that normally seen with the granulomatous inflammatory reaction with their foamy histiocytes like, say, a, a xanthoma? No, not typically. No, no, not really. And if you look carefully, notice that these cells are almost forming little kind of aggregations and that almost looks like a little tuft of these clear staining cells. So when you think about clear cytoplasm inside a cell, what's the differential diagnosis of stuff that sit, that's clear inside of cell? So it can be lipid, that would be a foamy histiocyte possibly, or maybe a histiocyte that's filled with mycobacterium lepri you know, or maybe a histiocyte that's filled with silicone. So it can be filled. So, so to ask yourself, so these cells are clear staining. Why? Is it definitely histiocyte with lipid or is it possibly something else? So what else okay. can give you clear material like this? Um, so lipid's one. What else yeah. can do it? Um, along the same lines, like a sebacite, a sebaceous material. Good, good. Se sebum, which is lipid also. Yeah. There's not too many things in dermatopathology that give you the clear cytoplasm. There's really only about four or so that we need to know about. You've said about three of them already. What's the last one there, the most, and the last most important one that gives you clear staining cytoplasm? Uh, is it glycogen? Yes, good, glycogen. And that's what happens to be here, interestingly enough. So these are, are glycogenated cells. So where do you see cells that have uh, glycogen in their cytoplasm? Hmm. <laughs> Just in a totally different direction than I was expecting. So I'm not sure. Okay. Well, if you look at normal skin, the most common places like in the outer root sheath of the hair follicle. You know, that's, that's where we see glycogen. And occasionally you get some glycogen also in the clear staining cells of the um, eccrine sweat unit because you obviously need glycogen to undergo that ATP mediated uh, ion transport 
that goes on down in the in the sweat gland. Uh, and then there, so if, 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 this, if this doesn't look like a sweat gland neoplasm, which I don't think it does, it doesn't really look like a trichalimal neoplasm, then we have to say, well, maybe this doesn't belong in the skin. Maybe it doesn't go here. Maybe this is something that's secondary. Okay. And if you look at this, if you think about a lesion that's got a lot of blood vessels, it's got clear staining cytoplasm, it's got areas that are undergoing necrosis on moss. So maybe it's a neoplasm. And maybe it doesn't normally live in the skin. Maybe this is something that's involving the skin secondarily. And so this area right over here, and this is, you know, this is more of an advanced case than a first year case, but it's, you know, you're kind of getting close maybe to your second year now. So you need to at least know a little bit about this. But what if this... Uh, was a biopsy from the scalp and they gave you some information. So this lesion popped up on the scalp of an 80 year old man and was thought to be a pyogenic granuloma and was pulsating. Would that help you with the differential? Yeah, I mean, um, scalp nodules, you always think metastases. Yeah, good. Um, one, yeah, one of the more common ones being renal cell on the scalp. Good. good, is this possibly a renal cell carcinoma? I think it's possible. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this is a metastatic renal cell, and those will give you clear cells. So if you think back to your basic histology, if you look at the you know, kidney, um, that almost looks like a little glomerulus right here. And this looks like a little, you know, maybe a collecting tubule, like a nephron. So these are recapitulating poorly differentiated nephrons, and they tend to be very, very bloody. Lots of extravasated erythrocytes lots of dilated blood vessels. Just think of, you know, a little piece of kidney is appearing on somebody's scalp. And, uh, and sort of the good news about metastatic renal cell carcinoma is that when you look at the cells here, of this clear cell lesion, notice that there's not a lot of super atypical uh, cells. There's not a lot of mitotic figures. There's not a lot of anaplasia. And that's actually these lesions, uh, these metastatic kidney cell cancers like this, as opposed to other types of metastases like melanoma and other things like that, they tend to do better, interestingly enough, than people that may have metastatic breast cancer or some other kind of cancer. So um, it's not always just an instant death sentence. They, they may ultimately die from it, but um, it's, it's relatively indolent compared to other metastatic neoplasms. So this is an example of a metastatic renal cell carcinoma. The other thing I would, would uh, so now is there a disease that we know about in dermatology that you have to be worried about with renal cell carcinoma? So they might, they probably wouldn't expect you to get this instantly. They might, but they might possibly ask another question. So what syndrome in dermatology is associated with this malignant metastatic renal cell carcinoma? Um, Birdhog today. Good. Excellent. Birdhog today. And one other thing that's another interesting thing about uh, these, meta, these uh, neoplasms that develop in patients with syndromes, if they're germline mutation neoplasms, like they develop from a germline mutation, they tend to behave better than a somatically acquired neoplastic condition. So patients that have uh, genodermatoses and get cancers tend to do better than patients that just kind of pop up with a renal cell carcinoma later in life for some other reason. So that's just a pearl, just to remember that 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 tends to be true. So that that's an example of a metastatic renal cell. This one, more straightforward. Now we had some special stains here too. Hi, this is Juliana. I can go for this one. Okay. Um, okay, so um, we have a punch. And it looks like the primary process is going on in the epidermis. Um, and Good. maybe from this power could be this uh, superficial dermis as well. Okay. But as we zoom in, um, so it looks like maybe there's a lot of inflammation reacting to what's going on um, in the epidermis. Okay, good. So you thought this was more of a neoplasm Mm -hmm. inflammation we just talked about this a minute ago versus an inflammatory process so that's good because you can get obviously lots of inflammation and in cancers you know the body doesn't like cancers it tries to make them go away with with uh, inflammation 
um, in many cases, that's how the PD, that's how the checkpoint inhibitors work. They try to get rid of the uh, tumors evading the host immune response. So this one, you might not need checkpoint inhibitors. <laughs> the body's trying to get rid of it on its own. That's so true. did you think it was an epithelial neoplasm or not epithelial neoplasm? Um, epithelial as in like, sorry, like in the epidermis? Well, or, or recapitulating an epithelium, you know, so, oh. would you, so yeah. Now you, you said something's in the epidermis. Mm -hmm. um, did you think it was malignant or you think it was benign? Um, let's see. So looking at it, I mean, the cells kind of look like a little bit different sizes. Um, there are some weird cells that I see that go up towards the top of the epidermis, which makes me think like, should I be looking for pagetoid spread? Um, okay, good, good. So you're seeing a so-called pagetoid intraepidermal neoplastic process. Yes. Are those usually benign or usually malignant? Usually they're malignant. Usually, usually they're malignant. There's a couple of exceptions, not many, but there yes. are a few exceptions. Like, for example, we see that in, in a so-called borscht yadison seborrheic keratosis, clonal seborrheic keratosis. Um, but usually it's malignant. And so it's also, we, we don't, can't assess breadth, symmetry, circumscription, but certainly we can see this involves all the way from this edge of the specimen over to this edge over here. Okay, so good. You've gotten it into the family of the intraepidermal pagetoid neoplastic processes. Now, there's about four to five things. There's not 50, so that's <laughs> good. So what is your differential diagnosis when you see this? Yeah, so the three main ones people talk about are like the melanoma, the squamous cell, the pagets, and then there's like the two like other ones to think about are like sebaceous um, carcinoma and Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Good. And then Merkel cell can give you an intraepidermal pagetoid proliferation. Obviously, malignant melanoma can give you an intraepidermal pagetoid proliferation. So how do you tell those apart? Is there anything here that can give you a clue that you may be dealing with one of those versus another? Yeah. So I look at kind of the cell types. Um, these ones, they kind of have this pale, lots of cytoplasm. Um, the other thing is, too, you can look at how they're like arranged, like are they like aggregated in nests? Are they kind of pushing down the basal layer of the epidermis? Um, good, good. That's exactly right. If you look carefully here, it's hard to see, but the so-called eyeliner sign mm -hmm. where there's a tiny bit of residual basal cell left at the bottom and it's not going fully from the basal cell layer all the way to the top. That's sometimes a subtle clue and the board's not going to expect you to use that to distinguish between these various entities. So, um, but that's helpful if you can see it on H and E. So obviously you're going to revert to special stains. And so what's the special stain that's most like, that's going to help you here uh, in distinguishing between these entities? Um, so there is, um, I guess there's a couple. If you're thinking, yeah, about the eyeliner sign and it pushing down the basal cell layer and the pale blue cell, something I have high in my differential would be um, pagets. And that stands for like EMA, CEA. Um, I, does it stain for S100? There's one other stain, cytokeratin 7, that, that's helpful in that as well. Sometimes that can stain pagetoid bowens as well. So I don't think it's totally always differentiating, but it's, all, it's virtually always positive in, the, in these types of pagets disease. And I think I have a photo of some of the special stains. Um, this first one is the CK7, and you can see that it's strongly positive. So if the, I think if they're going to show you this and expect you to get the, the diagnosis, they probably would show you a stain, they show you the, the histology, then they would probably show you this and tell you to CK7 and say the, the best diagnosis or the most likely diagnosis is, and then the diagnosis obviously would be extra mammary or, or mammary Paget's disease. And then uh, this is a carcinoembryonic antigen stain, which highlights the cells also. So this is an example of extra mammary Paget's disease. Now they, they might then ask a question like, what workup should you do in a patient that's got extra memory patch disease like this. Um, you would you just cut it out and send them home or would you want to make sure they didn't have anything else going on? Yeah, so I mean, classically, like you learn in med school that like 
the breast one has underlying cancer and then the extra mammary one doesn't but in real life um i like have learned that i guess you treat extra mammary pageants like it's malignant and you do excise it but it likes to keep coming back and spreading well, there's two types of extramarine patches. There's one type that is not associated with an internal malignancy uh, that's thought to maybe come from primordial apocrine cells in the epidermis. And then just basically it's just purely an intraepidermal process. But if it occurs in the groin area, uh, you have to be very concerned about underlying GI and GU cancer. So you want to always make sure, especially if it's in the groin area, that you are not missing that. So you want to go back and work the patient up and make sure they didn't have an underlying, say, uh, colorectal cancer or make sure they didn't have uh, an underlying GU cancer. So in a woman, you'd obviously make sure they didn't have a vaginal cancer or uterine cancer or cervical, something like that spreading to this area versus just being purely starting in the skin. So always remember that, that you want to, make, especially if it's extra mammary patches disease, exclude an underlying cancer from the GU area. If it's mammary, exclude underlying intraductal carcinoma. But if it occurs in the middle of somebody's back, you don't really have to be that concerned about an underlying cancer in that situation. So those are the, the main teaching points about this. And this, this was extra mammary patches. This wasn't mammary. This occurred in the groin area. And uh, I don't remember if this patient, they may have had an underlying GU cancer. Okay. I think it's about time you guys have to head off to clinic, I believe. So uh, we got through seven out of eight. So we'll uh, save the last one for the next session and we'll, uh, we'll